are going to talk about systems in a kind of loosely defined sense. We will uh, give our presentations and so we'll take a brief break uh, in time for our keynote presentation by Dr. Alina Williams, who will be introduced by, by Professor Uchel. Oh. So obviously a lot of our thinking today has revolved around not only spin winder, but electrical system. With a work like electrical system, Nancy Holt was interested in externalizing basic technological systems, as we've thought a lot about. Those which, as she noted, were usually hidden behind walls and beneath the earth, therefore relegated to the realm of the unconscious, she said. Quote, since the sculptures are exposed fragments of vast hidden networks, they are part of open-ended systems, part of the world. In this session, this pairing of papers, we turn our attention away from infrastructural systems like electrical system, and we reflect on some ways in which Holt's work brings natural and social systems into focus, making visible our own participation in these systems. We focus on different social systems. Melissa Regan is interested in Holt's work within a rural context. Well, I will continue our thinking about Holt's work largely on college campuses, as well as a landfill, <laughs> for good measure. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Reagan, an art historian and associate professor at Montana State University, where her courses specialize in environmental aesthetics and intellectual and institutional histories of art. She is the author of Domesticating the Invisible, Form and Environmental Anxiety in Postwar America, and the editor of Jack Burnham's Dissolve into Comprehension, Writings and Interviews, 1964 to 2004. Reagan has been a core critical studies fellow at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, a Radcliffe fellow at Harvard University, and a recipient of an arts writer's grant from the Warhol Foundation and Creative Capital. Based in Livingston, Montana, Melissa's new research project, Range Life, considers the importance of environmental emplacement to art making in the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. These are just some of uh, Professor Reagan's contributions and interests right now. Um, and I hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. Reagan to the stage. So it seems like it's easier, it's probably, e oh, those are, that's my paper. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Oh, thank you, and especially to Rebecca. I have treats for you in my bag, so I'll remind me to give them to you. I'll see if I can remember how this, how this works. It's been a while. Um, there may be no outside to the system, but it certainly has its outskirts. My place on the outskirts is rural Montana, a place whose invisibility to the contemporary art world's critical apparatuses, depopulated landscape, and minim minimal archives are at once the challenges and opportunities of a rural art or art history. It's this region and its land use practices that are at the center of my current research, various refer variously referred to as the grasslands, prairies, or rangelands. It's a vast area connecting North America in one long ruminant corridor and it's very hard to see. This is the art world into which Nancy Holt dropped in 1972 when she and Robert Smithson, oh, she and Robert Smithson accepted the offer to visit the University of Montana. The local faculty, whose campus museum had closed in 1967, had been allowed to co-opt its visit visiting artist program. While it was Smithson who received the invitation, it was Holt who ended up with a solo exhibition during their stay. Keen to advance a line of inquiry begun, begun in her New York studio, she took full advantage of her position as a trailing spouse to enlist a group of graduate students in fabricating and installing a site-engaged sculpture, Missoula Ranch Locator's Vision Encompassed. Set in an expansive outdoor setting in what was becoming a signature radial form and hued to magnetic north, the Ranch Locators were a turning point on her way to designing sun tunnels and a further development of her interest in the effect of spaciousness on visual perception, peaked by her first trip to the desert west with Heiser and Smithson in 1968. 
The installation of the ranch locators serves as a compelling rural urban nexus for thinking about the ways that the ocular nature of Holt's perceptual art and the artwork status as a kind of intermediary between user and site might draw attention for better or worse to settler epistemologies that hide within the landscape and that were legible to local viewers who aided in the work's construction. The ranch locators were five foot tall galvanized steel pipes set in a circle punctuated along its perimeter at eight equidistant compass points and topped with hollow tubes resembling lensless telescopes that could be used to bound and flatten the visual array. Despite their simplicity, the locators could be put to many uses. They could draw attention to details like a cracked window or an exhaust pipe or defamiliarize and abstract a cityscape. They could compel a viewer forward or make them stop in their tracks. The locator series evolved out of her buried poems and what she called her trips and tours, both of which lured the observer out into the world using language, either written or recorded, to focus attention and structure peripatetic experience. In 1967, for example, she gave a group of friends recorded directions to Stone Ruin, a deteriorating mansion in New Jersey, but elaborated the directions in such a way that the listener was compelled to inhabit Holt's own visual experience of the site following in her footsteps and noticing what she noticed, as though privy to her private experience. However, through the group, tour group's photo documentation, they complete the work, demonstrating the impossibility of perfectly occupying another subject position. Like an epistolary story, Holt's use of orienting devices, like treasure maps or trail guides, also conflated the past and present, as well as the guide and tourist attempting to access the viewer's attention directly as a kind of visual divulgence that simultaneously possessed the beholder. In her film, Locating Number no. Two from 1972, the same year as The Ranch Locators, she and an interlocutor try to describe in real time the abstracted views through a locator onto the city. The observed objects are cut off from context clues of scale and figure ground relationship, Without the gestalt of a nameable form, the truncated images serve to highlight the inadequacy of language to keep up with or capture the flow of perception. Like blinders on a horse, the viewfinders encompass and control vision, but they are also devices wherein the mutability of sight or sight uh, confronts the fixity of a receptive surface, like a negative or a wall, and where the viewer becomes transfixed by a moment of optical intensity. There's something kind of bittersweet, I think, in her desire to use language or media to fix the transient as it flits across the visual field, and where information loss is built into the system from the start. As opposed to a kind of personal nostalgia or sentimentalism, Holt's locators evince a sort of anticipatory nostalgia, which has a temporal complexity that depends at once on an experience of the present, an imagined future, and an imagined future past a mechanism for coping with change across flows of time or the spaciousness of an unfamiliar place. Holt's film and photo documentation of Missoula Ranch locators was exhibited in the University of Montana's Gallery of Visual Arts in November of 72. At the start of the film, the camera pans clockwise around the exterior of the circle of pipes, revealing the crowded visual field of Ted Waddell's ranch. A barn, a metal studio, old cars, a split rail fence, and several in-progress sculptures camouflage the locators whose material presence is flimsy compared to the agricultural equipment that surrounds them. In the next passage, the camera now still faces east out onto an open field behind Waddell's ranch. We see graduate student Pat Zentz enter the frame from left and demonstrate how to use the locators. Moving methodically clockwise around the circle, Zentz first stands on the circle's exterior and looks through the locator. He then rotates to look from the interior out to the surrounding landscape. He repeats this action with each of the eight pipes. And the remainder of the film comprises shots through the locators reenacting what Zenz has just witnessed. In each interior facing shot, the locator, whoop, the locator sighted across from the viewer is perfectly framed by the artwork's aperture, bisecting the view. In each exterior shot, the landscape is horizonless. The eye is drawn instead to the life at the heart of the agricultural landscape, its mundane labors and minor details, the movement of station wagons and motorcycles along the small highway, a calf at play in a field, a child exiting a truck, and not to the picturesque view into which the viewer could project herself from pastoral foreground to sublime background. 
Still photos of Missoula ranch locators, on the other hand, draw the viewer's attention to the collective nature of environmental perception. Every space on the exterior of the circle is occupied by a student who peering, or faculty member, peering through their own keyhole, observes another person looking back at them, peering through their own viewing portal. Reversing the view as all look from the interior of the circle outward, the students are nevertheless subject to the camera's gaze and likewise spy the camera in their lenses. At the same time, they make the human perceiver their subject. As uh, Holt uh, remembered, the ranch locators become a human focal point. And in that respect, they bring the vast landscape back to human proportion and makes the viewer the center of things. Alternating between interior and exterior views, one alternates between looking at the figure, the opposite locator, and the field, quite literally a field of canola. Holt deploys the existentialist look to concretize the act of looking at the environment. In looking through the locators, the world is constituted as, as objective, we feel, in that it is something that is there, and if we believe Sartre, identical for all viewing subjects, Holt, Zentz, the viewer of the film, us. One looked through the locators to see, but what one saw was the environment, seen. And yet the push and pull of Holt's apertures forced the perceiver into a kind of intimate proximity with the environment, while all, also putting it at a distance. The viewfinders take possession of and appear to fix the image, but they also attest to a continual loss of the whole. And this effect is particularly notable in her film on the making of sun tunnels, in which what appears to be a close-up view of the work is suddenly scale shifted by the appearance of a figure kind of moving through the frame. So the ranch locators were kind of cardinal in two senses. That is that they're tied to the cardinal directions, but they're also close at hand, right? They serve as devices for the displaced, the tourist, the visiting artist, the settler interlopers in a landscape who seek to escape their mere locations, right? Their, their points in a universal metric space and to form something like a more authentic attachment to place. Land artists mimicking of the archaeoastronomical forms like um, the observatories we'll hear about in a moment show us a desire by that generation to connect the idiosyncrasies of physical spaces outside the bounds of the art world centers to larger celestial orders. The skyward turn and hold solar works, or, for example, orient the individual to a thing outside of a place, construed as a center, a thing that exists beyond its boundary. A physical attribute of a site, a large tree or a terraform, for example, might constitute an element in a social space that directs our attention, our movement, and our values within that place. But certain alignments, certain types of alignments, disconnected from the physicality of a place, can entail any site beyond the center's borders, and thus corroborate colonial ideas like the supposed freedom of modern Western humanity from some of the more earthbound ways of locating the self. These alignments don't sever the traveler's attachment to larger embracing orders, especially the rhythm of celestial spatiotemporal patterns. They are, in fact, mobile, they are not, however, neutral in that they do not annihilate the dialectic of center and periphery since the center's spatial orders are not challenged by those things that exist outside of its boundaries. It's hard not to notice the panoptic arrangement of the locators, their resemblance to a, a cyclorama, for example, the way that they make the viewer the center of the seen world. And since the 1990s, scholars have noted that the ocular character of colonial domination and the importance of reporting observed phenomenon to subduing others. Holt's frequent recourse to the locational should alert us to the tendency of white settler cultures to use orienting devices and other acts of enclosure to control these chaotic spaces at the margins. Holt's optical technology support a viewer who has gone out of bounds, who's in unfamiliar territory, who needs or wants a guide. The site, however, remains rooted and provincial. The site-specific sculpture is allied with a center that is elsewhere. But, the locators are, of course, reversible and become richer through local understandings of its site. Installation documentation is particularly telling. Female faculty and graduate students are notably absent from the project. Dean Douglas, the, the director of the Gallery of Visual Arts, the guy in the glasses, um, had recently been engaged in a kerfuffle with local textile artists um, whose work was not recognizable to him as serious art. Um, he is visible, however, taking directions from Holt as he looks through one of the locators. Um, Holt's ability to marshal resources, including labor, which we've already noted, played into a kind of gender politics of the region's art scene. 
like the other graduate students who installed the ranch locators and who perform as proxies for the film's viewer, Zentz um, and Dean Douglas were raised in agriculture, hailing from places like Molt, Laurel, Fairfield, Pony, and other hamlets across the state. The students came with a working knowledge of the daily tasks of farm life, welding, woodworking, riding, post hole digging, and applied them to the chores of the artist studio. They were tasked by Holt with collecting the galvanized steel pipe for the locators and with welding them in Waddell's shed, a job they enthusiastically completed since it allowed them to show off their hard-won skills. Waddell's own study of minimalist sculpture, while at the Brooklyn Museum Art School, had left him with an appreciation of the aesthetic of the well-built as a value shared by both sculptor and ranch hand alike. The locators make that connection in their material as well. The pipe is the same kind used for fences and for cattle gates, as well as their focus. They place equal emphasis on Waddell's split rail fence and on his sculptures. The two key financial support structures for art making in rural states are the public university and the ranch. And both reward populism and manual skill over other forms of cultural capital. In Holton Smithson's comical portrayal of art world types in the 1968 film, East Coast, West Coast, Holt plays a hectoring New York conceptual artist to Smithson's caricature of a disaffected Californian who dismisses her cerebral approach and can't stop insisting that his proximity to native people gives him more spiritual authority and connection to the land. Quote, the guys I used to hang out with, they didn't know anything about the system. They were true, authentic Western types. Fair enough. Uh, the move of white artists west has represented a calculated trade-off of cultural relevance in exchange for a supposedly more authentic and less self-critical life on the land, in which native people often are cast in the role of authenticating agents. The kinds of artists that Holt met in Montana, mostly male and white, had arrived or returned to Montana to distance themselves from what they saw as an overly self-conscious and language-driven New York art scene. The kind of work that had traction, in Montana at the time, applied modernist aesthetics to functional objects and was still invested in the value of labor and, and of the medium, especially clay and metal, even as they began to absorb some of the lessons of site specificity and an interest in the situational aspects of objects. As Jenny Sorkin has deftly argued, the studio craft tradition in this region also emphasized the social nature of art production as a performance which grows a community of makers and binds them to a network of belonging. The absence of native artists is also notable, especially given the popularity of UM's short-lived but, but, but bountiful graduate program in Indian arts and its students' active participation in AIM. It's notable, though not surprising, but especially since the work is not in fact in Missoula but 22 miles north of Missoula in a census de designated area called Arli, on the southern tip of the Flathead Reservation on which reside the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, or to be more precise, um, or to be more precise on a small non-native inholding on that reservation. Invisible to the outsider's eye is the patchwork of land ownership types um, this is a crossroads for agricultural interests, sites of cultural and historical significance to the Salish and Kootenai people, and the tourist industry that connects Glacier National Park, those cars and motorcycles you see in the film, and Flathead Lake to nearby towns. What else so-called ranch is also more properly a ranchette. A Waddell was raising his children while working in the art department and used his studio for making large steel sculptures and for welding horse trailers and irrigation pipe trailers for his neighbors. Waddell's ranchette does not live up to the imagined expansiveness that the word ranch connotes on the East Coast. He had about six acres with a few cows and chickens and a pig. It was formerly a post office, likely purchased in the 1910s when land on the Flathead Reservation was made available to white settlement. It's more what we call a mountain park. It packs more nutrition per square inch than in grasslands in the eastern half of the state across the continental divide, and so can support livestock on a much smaller plot of land and with less effort. They are thus more likely to fit a kind of homestead settler pattern rather than the vast ranging units on prairies where um, uh, numerous uh, native allotments are appropriated and consolidated in places like Pine Ridge, South Dakota. 
Around the time that the ranch locators were produced, uh, the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes began what has been a successful effort to achieve sovereignty over the majority of the Flathead's resources, especially Flathead Lake, which had been preposterously d divided down the middle in 1855. Waddell's former home site sits adjacent to a small two-acre lot held by the Flathead Reservation, a remnant of once communal land use and shared resources that was broken down over generations and surrounded by private units, each administratively divided, not by natural boundaries, but by longitude and latitude. Um, I haven't been able to verify the history of this specific site, but it is likely one of the fractionalized allotments of land recently bought back and restored to collective tribal ownership reinscribing the land from a logic of real estate back into one of shared resources. And this buyback has been made more likely precisely because of these sort of smaller, um, these sort of smaller um, units on, um, on the flathead than in the eastern part of the state. At the same time, the site, like many locations on the western side of the Continental Divide, has undergone a rapid increase in land values. with the median home cost of half a million dollars. Nestled in the narrow end of the valley, the site of ranch locators is a green park-like area with vistas of Mission Mountains and easy access to recreational areas, a college town to the south, and due to the lush landscape, the ability to live a quasi-agricultural lifestyle. Location, location, location. Like other members of his department, when he got tenure, Waddell quit his job. He gave up his land at Arley, opting to become a full-time rancher in Moult, Montana, where flummoxed by um, the prairie's vast horizons, he stopped making sculptures altogether and became a painter. In 2003, the three-bedroom farmhouse was built on the ranch locator's site, a testament to its sen sensitivity to view sheds over other environmental aesthetics. Holt's work was attuned to the colonial impulse to enclose and anticipated the second colonization of rural gentrification, here juxtaposed with a simultaneously pu simultaneous push for the decommodification of land by the Salish Kootenai. While the ranch locators reiterated and underscored the settler compulsion to bound and enclose, most rancher artists associated with the piece's fabrication cite their own experience of landscape as one marked by movement over large tracts of dry land in search of the kind of proximal knowledge that unfolds over seasons and generations. Likewise, these artists tend to privilege non-visual modes of orientation with the expansive spaces they encounter based in sound, wind, terraforms, or botanical knowledge. Dennis Voss and Pat Zentz, both formerly of the UM program, took up full-time ranching as well, making art during seasonal downtimes. Unlike Waddell, they did not give up sculpture entirely. Instead, their terographic instruments elaborated subtle differences across the visual sameness of the open prairie. The prosthetic machine used to harrow the land harrows the body as well. Like me, they interpreted the locators as instruments, or more precisely, as interfaces, the place where environmental and human perceptual systems meet and communicate. But they also make pal palpable a pastoral spatiality that interrelates these systems with territorial awareness and ideological attachments to space that may remain invisible to outsiders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was wonderful. My talk today is inspired by a phrase used by the critic and curator Lucy Lepard, one of Nancy Holt's closest friends, to describe Holt's work in an essay written for the catalog Nancy Holt's Sightlines, edited by Alina Williams for her exhibition that has been a touchstone for so much Holt scholarship of the past decade. 
In Lepard's essay, Tunnel Visions, Nancy Holt's Art in the Public Eye, she tells us that Holt's primary aesthetic and social interests converge in her public observatories, which reflect her, de her determination to connect people with the planet Earth. Lepard goes on to explain that while the notion of public can generally be understood as extroverted, Holt's work, on the other hand, encourages introversion or intravision, converting public spaces into private refuges. I want to explore the concept of the public observatory, a public space and private refuge, a site of intravision or looking inward, and the experience of seeing as part of the public sphere. Holt's emphasis on observation and a social and individual, as a social and individual experience connects the self to a collective history as well as to natural and planetary systems. Both of these terms, the notion of public and that of the observatory, held, sp held specific meanings for Holt. And indeed, Spinwinder is a public observatory, a place of refuge and public memory, a point from which to observe landscape through acknowledgment of its history and its future. Like other artists working in the environment, Robert Smithson, for instance, Holt did not consider herself a public artist in the 1960s and for much of the 1970s. Quote, I never thought of myself as entering the public sphere. All I was doing was being more engaged with the external world, she explained in 1992. Her first major environmental sculpture, Views Through a Sand Dune, would not have seemed, a pu seemed public in the sense of the public sphere, a social space of consensus, shared culture, and public memory. Holt created views from a sand dune on Narragansett Beach in October of 1972 as an artist in residence at the University of Rhode Island just a few months after completing the Missoula Ranch locators. She inserted a five foot long cement and asbestos pipe through a sand dune, creating a viewing aperture nine inches wide in di diameter. We might imagine experiencing this work on a lovely sunny fall day like today, it was located only about 25 miles southwest along this very coastline 49 years ago. The sight line through a sand dune created a new temporary view that is observed, framed, fixed by the gaze, shot by the camera. As Pamela Lee has written, views, works such as the locators and views through a sand dune quote, present us with the instrumentality of vision, its props and tools, positioning us as both subjects and objects of that very act. Views from a sand dune was a work for the public, made with public money and presumably accessible to any interested beachgoer. But the nine inch diameter pipe, like the one and a half inch aperture of the locator, invites a single viewing subject, largely a private and self-reflexive form of seeing that forecloses the social interaction and exchange of the public sphere. By the late 1970s, Holt's outlook had shifted. She completed sun tunnels and took on a large-scale public commission at Western Washington University that we have heard about. I understand both of these works, a classic of land art and a public sculpture on a public university campus, as engaging the public sphere, inviting participation in an act of observation that was social and individual at once. As Holt described her approach to public art in 1985, she saw Quote, to develop a strong sense of place, which includes the sociology and psychology of the area, as well as the topography, built environment, and local history, end quote. Though Sun Tunnels is remote, Holt conceived of it as public art, sited intentionally near a public access road and open to all. Sun Tunnels certainly holds the potential of real isolation for the visitor, but it's a social space. In 1977, Holt described a summer solstice camp out attended by locals and her intent to bring local residents to a valley they had never visited. Sun Tunnel's axial orientation to the solstices is an intrinsically public gesture as well, orienting the work to a human history of rituals and celebrations around the solstice. Stone Enclosure, a naked eye observatory on a public university campus is public in a more conventional way a retreat after class, or a sheltering place to study and hang out with friends. To observe publicly is to share in the experience of seeing, 
not simply as perception, but as a cultural and symbolic experience that recognizes a collective history and vision of the future. This concept is, I believe, intrinsically political, encouraging viewers to see themselves as part of a public, as observers of a place, but also stewards and agents. As Holt said in 1983, she wanted to make art a more necessary part of the world, of society. Sky Mound, a partially completed landfill earthwork in the New Jersey Meadowlands begun in 1984, was to include a wildlife sanctuary and naked eye observatories, a sun structure and star viewing mounds. The earthwork is bordered by the New Jersey Turnpike and Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. And here's a recent uh, satellite view from Google Maps from this week. So you can get a sense of the kind of um, industrial environment. Holt relished the opportunity to connect viewers to planetary systems and local ecologies amidst a hyper-industrialized space. She cited the rabbits, muskrats, snakes, and many species of migratory birds that would benefit from clean water and native plants restored to the site. Sky Mound was an observation point aligned to the cosmos and offering what Matt Coolidge called uh, views to the consuming landscape, Manhattan, Jersey City, the turnpikes, the industries, the scrambling logistics yards, the incoming planes, not to mention the, the perceptual awareness of decades of consumer refuse beneath your feet, given physical expression by the mound and controlled methane torches at the site's perimeter. By the way, the site is now a, a solar farm uh, that you can see driving down the New Jersey Turnpike. Here you can see this, uh, one of the methane flares uh, at the corner the right corner. At solar noon on the summer solstice, a, so a circle of light cast through a steel structure, which you can see in the center, uh, was to fit exactly into a ring on the ground of the sun structure. Alas, Sky Mound, described by Holt as her lifelong project, was never completed. The earthwork of enormous scale and complexity was dependent on fickle public funding. As Coolidge writes, in its unfinished state, Sky Mound is a liminal monument to the conditions of ourselves and our times, emerging from the wastelands of yesterday and facing the possibilities that exist in the perpetually receding and recycling future. Elements of Sky Mound are found in other contexts throughout Holt's body of work, as is the ethos of the public observatory, a private refuge where seeing is an act of acknowledgment that entails a kind of responsibility, even. Solar Rotary on the campus of University of South Florida incorporates a sun structure very similar to that proposed for uh, Sky Mound, aligned to the summer solstice that casts a ring upon a circular concrete bench, within which is embedded a meteor as old as the solar system that fell to Earth nearby. Solar Rotary simultaneously acknowledges the planetary cycles, the deepest of geological time, and human ambition. On different dates, the solar ring is cast upon plaques in its rotary, which you can see sort of faint circles uh, embedded in the ground. For instance, on March 27th, the ring centers on a plaque denoting Conquistador Ponce de Leon's first contact on the Florida coast in 1513. On September 5th, the ring highlights the groundbreaking ceremony for the university in 1958. On July 20th, the Apollo 11 moon landing launched from Cape Canaveral up the coast in 1969. Solar Ring is an observatory where one sees place through the lens of history, spanning the origin of the solar system to acts of modern civilization that have shaped both the local and the global. It is a locator of sorts, locating the visitor on this timeline not simply as observers, but actors. Spinwinder 2 is a public observatory focused around seeing as a collective and individual act. Holt wrote of the sculpture, it has an inside and an outside and can be easily entered. The space inside can be experienced while walking beneath the arches or standing within the inner element. The surrounding environment is seen from the inside of the sculpture the outside brought in, the inside out. Unlike Holt's other public observatories, Spinwinder is without an oculus or locators that channel vision within a circular frame. 
It invites a panoramic or embodied kind of open air viewing, the surrounding environment seen from the inside. Inside, one becomes incorporated into the sculpture. One observes the campus through an apparatus representative of textiles manufacture, the labor and technology that built this region in the 19th and 20th centuries, and the reason UMass, UMass Dartmouth is cited here. In Holt's words, Spinwinder is, quote, a contained place of memory and reflection on this essential local industry. Though it's largely invisible now, this history of textiles is the social and economic foundation of the mown lawns and parking lots, brutalist buildings, and the campus observatory, which itself can be observed from within Spinwinder. Beneath one's feet are artifacts of this history. The visitor to Spinwinder is not a passive observer, as we saw today, but <laughs> invited to spin or wind the central spool and peripheral bobbins to see it in the round as one moves in circles. Seeing becomes entwined with the embodiment of an historical form of labor, the repetitive spinning and winding of fiber at a 19th century textiles mill. There is no single point of view. Spinwinder entails multi-sensory seeing in which landscape is experienced from a location through movement rather than the focused, channeled seeing of a locator. This kinetic element is rare, if not unique, within Holt's oeuvre, and the kinetic seeing invited by the sculpture is of a different sort than the focused lens of modern observation. Holt was interested in UMass Dartmouth's observatory located across the campus entrance, which she documented in research photographs. You can see her photograph on the left and a photograph by Professor Uchel on the right. The camera, the telescope, and the observatory, tools that privilege visuality as the master sense within modernity's scopic regime, are referred uh, are referenced by many of Holt's works. Even the shape of Spinwinder might be seen in relation to the dome of the nearby observatory. Observation through the telescope's lens is very different from the naked eye observatory. Stars might be hard to see, but can be imagined through the dense particulates of the New Jersey sky. For instance, thinking of the unfinished sky mound. The experiential seeing invited by Spinwinder through the historical form of, form of textiles technologies and embodying a form of labor, stages a dialogue with the adjacent observatory. Both are public observatories in different senses. Holt identified herself as a mystic, and even, when she, even, and even as she was fascinated by instruments of vision, understood the limits of empirical observation. As Holt's friend Saul Lewitt wrote, quote, conceptual artists are mystics rather than rationalists. They leap to conclusions that logic cannot leap, cannot reach. Holt's mysticism was informed by Emily Dickinson, who wrote the poem in uh, the lines of the poem. In the lines of a poem, quote, the stars whole secret in the lake, eyes were not meant to know, end quote. Dickinson prompts us to recognize the limits of vision as we participate in the empirical observation of the modern age. This line is from her poem, The Outer from the Inner, a title summoned by Holt's description of Spinwinder, the outside brought in, the inside out. That which the telescope can't see, the labor of textiles workers, for instance, that built this region, is restored by Spinwinder. Thank you. So we just have a very brief, um, maybe one or two questions. One question. Uh, Melissa, would you like to come up and we'll, if, if anyone would like to answer, ask a question of either of us, just take a minute here. Uh, we're running a little bit behind before Alina Williams's talk. Yes. Lisa. But I'm going to try and just condense it into one. Um, in Judy Fox's presentation, she talked about Wild Spot mm -hmm. having this wonderful long term reciprocal relationship to the campus, to the, to the campus of, of Worldly. And both of your 
in both of your presentations, this sense of reciprocity seemed really important. And in fact, Melissa, you use this wonderful phrase, site engaged rather than site specific yeah. or site responsive. So my question to both of you is really this reflection on the work that the sculpture does once it starts to have its own life, once it becomes independent of the artist. Do you want to start? Question. I'm kind of, yeah. well, it's interesting because I think that with the idea of, of instrumentation, instrumentation, you're already sort of thinking about something which has its own life, right? Which can sort of be mobile and transient and live in many different places and engage site, but not, not be destroyed by its separation. And of course, as, as you know, the Avignon locators is a kind of reciting of this. Yeah, it's, it, and yeah, it, it both is and isn't the same work. Um, it's very much bound up, and certainly its meanings for me are very much bound up with, with, its, with its initial site in Arly. Um, and yet it, 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 it retains much of its character um, as, as a device in this new setting. So there is, in, in some sense, I find there is this kind of reciprocity. The reciprocity that I see in her work has to do with the sort of, the, the almost sort of playing with tools of universality as a lens through which to experience place, or to, there's a kind of contrast that is set up or a contradiction that is set up there, I think that one question that I know that Kirsten and I both have together that we're constantly kind of asking ourselves is, why vision? Why always vision? <laughs> um, and I, and I, do think, I do think that's, that's really at the crux of thinking about what, what Holt is doing with these recurrent themes of the circle and the oculus and, and, and all of these, these kind of recurrent devices that are constantly being sort of reshaped and reset in relation to each other to produce n new experiences. So I would take a slightly different tack in answering that and point to uh, a, remark by, by, a remark by Christina Podesva uh, in which she, she points out that Holt's sculptures are incredibly open-ended, that there's a certain indeterminacy about them. And I think that that's a kind of wisdom of the artist to invite um, a sort of interchange of, of ideas that can become that can unfold over time. Of course, she can't anticipate how the work will be received in 2021, but leaving it as a form that's evocative and yet uh, also open to different readings and different significances, I think the interactivity, um, the particip participatory nature of, of Spinwinder is incredibly important as something to push. Um, that also leaves it very open to new forms of um, interaction and relevance for visitors. Um, and that's a, a notable thing about that work. So I think we need to, Rebecca, alas, Rebecca's, um, hit the gong, I think. Rebecca's hitting, we, we can't not take a <laughs> question from Ardell. Hi, um, I'm just curious because Melissa, you, you mentioned the panopticon nature of some of those locators. Yeah. And I'm curious if in like Nancy's archive or your research, um, if she was kind of aware of Foucault's yeah. um, theories about the panopticon and the impact of that. Yeah, oh, absolutely. This is a work in progress. So definitely the, the archives are kind of the next stop. The interesting thing about this project is it actually began as a, as a sound project. That is an, an oral history project. So I, it's somewhat bound by the, the logistics of the pandemic. So a lot of my, a lot of my informants are local informants. So um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an open question that I, I would, I, I'm dying to get into the archive and <laughs> go dig around. So absolutely, um, I can't wait to sort of see what, what's known and what's unknown, but I think it's interesting to sort of see what we can get out of simple observation. Um, and um, in terms of the panoptic, I mean, you know, it's one of those things that I kind of, I kind of kept sort of playing around with and I just couldn't stop seeing it. And, and I think that even the idea of a location as opposed to a place, that she keeps insisting on this idea of location and these kind of um, sort of measurable relationships to, um, 
to a kind of um, diagrammatic space. Like it's just, it's all there, but it's bound up in the kind of cosmic and mystic and all of the things that, that Kirsten points out. And I, I think that's actually one of the things that's really lovely about the forms that she's choosing is that they can, they can be, they can be both simultaneously and their sort of ability to exist in this, this ambivalent space is really sort of fun, fun for us as, as interpreters, I think. Thank you so much, everyone. And now it's time to turn it over to Melissa, to, I'm sorry, to turn it over to Rebecca to introduce our keynote event.